Welcome to this evening's Life in Pictures with Sir Anthony Hopkins, which is sponsored by Deutsche Bank, who are adding it to their existing arts activities. They already sponsor the Freeze Art Fair and a program for children learning at the Globe about Shakespeare. Now, I'm delighted to be here this evening because, of course, Anthony Hopkins is beyond parallel. I mean, there is no parallel in the sense in terms of a, an actor who has such great range and power and subtlety and artistry all at once. Ladies and gentlemen, Sir Anthony Hopkins. I began an actor really by accident. I was born in Port Albert, South Wales. Uh, not the best student in the world as a schoolboy. And uh, just by chance, I got a scholarship to the College of Music and Drama in Cardiff in 1955. And uh, it was a real fluke. I'd never acted before. I remember the principal was Raymond Edwards, and I learned a piece from Othello. And uh, it was the bedroom scene where I killed Desdemona. I didn't know. I'd never even read the play. <laughs> but uh, I sort of had a look at it. Uh, because I wasn't a good student, and I did this full of, you know, sound and fury, so much so that the principal at the end, he said, uh, Raymond Edwards, he said, do you want to sit down? Are you all right? <laughs> and he said, uh, well, it's very good, he said, and uh, I got a scholarship, and uh, I spent two years there until 57, and so on and so forth. I, I, uh, I got an audition for a RADA. I thought I'd better get some proper training, because at the Welsh College, I was too young, really, to take in much information went to the Royal Academy, and then I was very fortunate. I came out in 63, went to Leicester, Phoenix Theatre, Liverpool, and uh, then the National Theatre with Laurence Olivier. And, uh, you know, it was a great time with Albert Finney and Maggie Smith and all of the people. When it came for Lion and Winter, which is 1968, I think, um, was it daunting? A, a tool, I'm sure you, you probably knew, but to be playing with Catherine Hepburn. Well, you know, when you're young, you're arrogant. You can feel you can do anything. I was, of course, uh, very impressed to be working with those two gigantic actors. Um, but I, I, I thought, well, I, I can't waste time being nervous. I just learn my lines, show up, and hope for the best. And uh, O'Toole was a great mentor as well for me. And Hepburn was extraordinary because I remember the first day we were in Ireland and I had a scene with her in, in the film, and uh, she said, um, can I talk to your mom? And I said, yeah. <laughs> she said, why do you play the whole scene with the back of your head to the camera? <laughs> she you do that, I'll steal the scene from you. I'll probably do that anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but she said to me, she gave me one piece of advice. She said, don't act. You don't have to act. You've got good shoulders, good voice. And she said, watch Spencer Tracy and Humphrey Bogart. I said, OK. And I thought it was a good piece of advice. And um, I had a wonderful time working with her. She was very generous and um, very tough as well. No lateness on the set, no unprofessionalism. And they both were terrific. Okay. One afternoon, my agent phoned up. He said, I'm going to send a script over. Um, where are you? I said, I'm in the dressing room. He said, I'm going to send a script. It's called Silence of the Lambs. I said, oh, yeah, what's the kiddies' story? It's a children's <laughs> story. <laughs> he said, no, it's with Ju Jodie Foster. I said, oh, that's good. It's Jonathan Demme. I said, yeah. Oh, uh, what is it, a kid's story? No, no. So why don't you read the part of Dr. Lecter? And um, I got the script that came over that afternoon. And uh, it was a Friday afternoon. I always used to go to the theatre early just to get away. And, and I started reading the script. And after 10 pages, I thought, I, I can't read anymore. Because uh, the part was so powerful. So I phoned my agent. And I said, is this an offer? He said, I don't know. I said, I won't read anymore till I know. He phoned me back two hours later. He said, Jonathan Demme is coming to see you. It is an offer. And I read the part, and, um, and I, knew, I knew it was going to be a life changer. I didn't know why. I understand these people for some reason. I'm not like it. <laughs> <laughs> but I understand the guy at the top of the stairs, yeah. that invisible presence. As I understand Hitchcock, yours, it's, I don't know what that's about. And I, but I, I do understand that kind of character. And, uh, and um, so I started reading it and going over it and went to America and we started filming and uh, had a wonderful time. And I knew, that it was, I knew that my instinct was right. I didn't want to analyze it. And I remember the first day we were filming and uh, Jody had been filming about five weeks before me. And, and I remember arriving in Lecter's cell, you know, and Jonathan saying, so 
how do you, we're going to have the camera move down the corridor and Jody's point of view and so on and so forth, Clarice. So how do you want to be seen? Do you want to be sketching or lying on the bed? I said, no, I'd just like to be standing in the center of the cell. He said, why? I can smell her coming down the corridor. Mm. He said, you're weird. <laughs> <laughs> Let's move on to talk about Hitchcock. Did you ever meet Alfred Hitchcock? I did. I met him on um, a Friday afternoon in uh, <laughs> Los Angeles. It was in 1979. I was with my agent who happened to be Hitchcock's agent. His name is George Jason. Uh, a wonderful agent. He's still and gone now. And we were having lunch, and um, I said, this Alfred Hitchcock. He said, I know. He said, you, would you like to meet him? I said, yes. Yeah. So we finished our meal. We walked down the length of the restaurant, and there was Alfred Hitchcock. Enormous. And um, George said, and he just received his knighthood, you see. So George said, good afternoon, sir. Alfred says, hello, George. How are you? <laughs> Very nice to see you. Say hello to Lillian. This is a client of mine, Anthony Hawkins. Charmed, I'm sure. Very good luck to you. And you can hear him covering up his London accent because <laughs> in America it sounds rather posh. <laughs> and the bearing is because of the enormous weight. But you can hear, because you can, I can hear, there's a Londoner there. So that enormously portentous voice is fake. <laughs> but in the film I, with Helen Mirren, there's a scene where I, we're talking about mortgaging the house and I revert back to London. I said, I wish we could do things as they were in the old days, love. Remember what it was like? <laughs> you know, we really made films in those days. He's a rough, working-class boy. So that enormous personality presented to the world audiences was the Hitchcock impersonation, really. You have played a notable number of real people. A particular attraction for you in that, or was it...? No, I just play whatever's offered me. If, they, if it's a good part, and uh, I mean, it's, um, uh, I, I love to work. Um, I, I don't, I like to take terrible challenges. I remember Oliver Stone phoning me and saying, I want you to play Nixon. I said, he must be out of his mind. <laughs> I said, I, Nixon, and I, he said, yeah, to play the President Nixon. I said, he must be crazy, I can't, I'm not American. He said, I want you to do it. So we met, and I decided not to do it. I thought he was crazy. <laughs> then, uh, so I said, no, I'm going to turn it down. He said, chicken, huh? <laughs> so, so I said, listen, I'm going to be over the Hyde Park Hotel, and I'll meet you. So I met him on the, uh, up near the Dorchester, and I went there. As I was walking along in the January morning, and the wind was blowing, the rain was falling, I thought, well, I must be crazy. He's a great American director, and he's offered me a part of a lifetime. It could be a disaster. So what? Just do it. And I... By the time I got to the hotel, I was waiting in the restaurant, and Olive came in. Chicken, huh? Because Oliver's got one way of speaking. Uh, he's a very rude man, but he's great to <laughs> He said, uh, he has a way of prodding you. And I said, no, I'm going to do it. You are? I said, yeah. And then the nightmare started. <laughs> and, uh, but he was great to work with. And he said to me one day, because I lost my nerve in the middle of the, the very first, uh, there was something that happened. And I thought, my God, I can't do this. We hadn't started filming, but he said, you're going to do it. He said, if you're scared, so what? So we all. He said, I'll tell you about fear. I was in Vietnam. Mm. He said, just go out there and do the best you can. Who cares? <laughs> it's only a movie. Come on, for God's sake. He <laughs> words to that effect. And I thought, yeah. And it was a great kick in the backside. And I went on to, to hell with it all. Mm. I've got a little phrase which I won't go into here because it's one rude word, but it means <laughs> screw it, or words to that effect. <laughs> and that's my philosophy. Get on with it. 